Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome back. We are going to be talking today about the influence of the Greeks and Greek culture on Jewish life, uh, which takes place beginning in the middle of this priestly period. If we're talking about the priestly period running from about 500 BCE to 100 CE with the destruction of the Jerusalem Temple, although we'll see they lost some of their power even a little before that, um, the Greeks appear in the Middle East beginning in the fourth century, so around the 300s BCE. And they begin with cultural influence first before actual literal conquest. Um, Greek culture was a very attractive culture to different parts of the Mediterranean, and the Greeks themselves were convinced that they had the best possible culture. In fact, the word in Greek for non-Greek or outsider was barbarian. And you can hear even in that echo the sense of cultural superiority that the Greeks had to refer to everybody else as the primitives who need our civilization. Um, but Greek civilization was in fact a very impressive uh, achievement in many different ways um, and in some ways radical ways that transformed tradition-bound societies. Um, it began with Greek traders who would travel across the Mediterranean. They were a, a very successful seafaring people and they created little colonies and cities along the uh, Mediterranean coast of Asia and what is today Turkey, Lebanon, and uh, the land of Israel and Egypt as well. Um, and ultimately, they did in fact spread and conquer uh, the territory. And so I'm gonna share with you a couple of maps that demonstrate this, just to give you the geographical context here. So here we have a picture of Alexander's conquest. Uh, Alexander is the rare king who was a good, a good king following a good king. Usually you have a good king and then a nebish, a, a no good uh, follower who was a son raised pampered in the palace. It happens many, many times in, uh, in human history. In this case, um, Philip's, Philip of Macedon, who was Alexander's father, was in fact a good king. He gave his son a good education, including education with one of the preeminent philosophers of the day, Aristotle. Um, and Alexander followed up on Philip's success by expanding his territory even more. Philip managed to conquer from Macedonia, which is somewhat north of Greece proper. He conquered all of Greece and made it part of a United Kingdom of Macedonia and Greece. And Alexander, taking over from Philip, extended that conquest. He first uh, conquered the Persian Empire. He conquered Egypt, you can see uh, uh, in the uh, lower left corner of the image went even further east into Persia itself, founded a number of important Greek cities, um, including Alexandria, which you see in Egypt, Persepolis, which is today in Iran and Persia, and a number of other uh, sites. And you can see that the reach of Greek culture is quite extensive into Central Asia, um, even if it pulled back a bit from the borders of India, which was as far as Alexander got, you can understand this is a very profound and widespread influence of this cultural impact. But we have to make a slight distinction between Hellenic culture and Hellenistic culture. Hellenic culture was Greek culture for Greeks in Greece. And so it was based in Hellas, which is the Greek term for Greece. Hellenistic culture was often an integration, a synthesis of Greek culture and the native culture. So you might have adapted your religious practice to match more with Greek language, culture, mores, and so on. Um, you might have changed your economic functions, your dress, your language. You were still not Greek. You were still Egyptian. You were still Jewish, Judean. You were still Persian, but you were now Hellenized. So you were Hellenistic. You were a sort of in between ground or acculturated into Greek culture. You can think of it that way. Um, so examples of things that the Greeks did to change. For one thing, when you have this extended cultural reach like this, you greatly expand trade and commerce. And so you can imagine under a unified Alexander-led Greek empire, you could have trade all the way from Asia uh, to, uh, to Europe. And uh, all under one empire makes it easier to do safely. Um, even after the breakdown into different kingdoms, it still maintained this uh, unified sense of commerce and the importance of commerce as a lifestyle. Um, you know, the old style of economy was you had the farmers and you had the shepherds, but now we have all kinds of other 
ways of making a living, including manufacture, um, including uh, trading at, at great distance. Um, and so there were always craftsmen, those kind of things before, but now it becomes a much larger scale and important and emphasized activity, so much so that the design of the city changes. Where in Asia, generally, the design of the city was centered around the temple or perhaps the palace. In a Greek city-state, the center was the agora. It was a long row with several columns set up on either side of it that meant the marketplace. And so you would have a stall and your booth and you would set up your wares and you would sell. And so you can see by the architecture how things have changed. Uh, when you replace the temple or the palace with the marketplace as the centerpiece of city architecture and the emphasis of cultural activities. And the other thing they added was something called a theater, where before all of the performance was the ritual performed in the temple and the ri ritual recitations of the priests. Now you have this new literature of drama and performance, um, and you have public uh, theaters designed um, in the Greco Roman world to present these stories. And often these stories that are presented are the stories of the gods. That's one of the definitions of mythology is um, of the gods, it's the, the tales of the gods. Um, so this becomes, of course, problematic if you're a Judean who's not supposed to talk about other gods, and yet the center of cultural activity in your Greek city state is, in fact, um, these stories of the gods. Greek language is very attractive as well. If you're in this international trading world and you're experiencing this wonderfully creative literature out there, you might decide it's easier to learn Greek or to have your children learn Greek with Greek tutors so that they have the advantage you don't have of not knowing the language. You can think, by the way, of the emphasis a lot of Eastern European Jewish immigrants put on their children learning proper English when they came to the United States. In some cases, it was a loss. They didn't learn as much Yiddish as they should have uh, to maintain that cultural connection. But the flip side was their parents achieved their goal of having their kids fluent in the dominant cultural and commercial language, which in New York was English, but in the ancient world, certainly in Alexandria, was Greek. In fact, the, um, the Jews were so successful in teaching their kids Greek that after a, after a couple of generations, they weren't so good at Hebrew anymore. <laughs> Um, and they actually had to translate the Hebrew Bible into Greek, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, other uh, attractions of Greek culture were leisure activities. Uh, we mentioned the theater, but think al also of athletics. You know, the Olympic Games were just one example of the Greek culture of the idealized human body and of fitness and of athletics. The gymnasium, which was done in the nude, by the way, uh, was a very attractive institution. Um, but that again led to some cultural conflict because in the nude, Jewish men and Greek men looked different. Um, and finally, you had the culture of the Greeks willing to change tradition. One of the innovations Alexander instituted, for example, was being clean shaven. He wanted to maintain his image as the boy king, and so he shaved his face. And a number of his soldiers imitated his example and shaved their faces as well. Now, Middle Eastern culture was a very hirsute, a very hairy culture. You may remember the pictures of the Assyrians with their square beards that they cut off on purpose to be intimidating, but to shave their face, that would make them look like a kid. That's not the point at all. Um, and so the tradition bound culture that were cover up your body, grow your beard, uh, were very different from a shave your face, wear a toga or nothing at all for athletic activities, uh, cultures like, uh, like Greco-Roman culture. Um, now, Alexander dies uh, with a heir in utero, actually, and uh, his empire ultimately breaks up into multiple pieces. So you have uh, one take over Macedon proper, one of his former generals, other Greek states uh, branch off from this. But the two major ones we're concerned with are this sort of uh, drab green one here and the orange one. The drab green one is called the Seleucid Kingdom, after General Seleucus, who was the first king of that uh, empire. And the Seleucid Empire had a very simple pattern to its kings. You had Seleucus, who was the founding king. You had Antiochus, his son, who became a co-king near the end of his reign. And then the next son was Seleucus II, and then Antiochus II, and so on, all the way down to Antiochus IV, who's the Antiochus we're interested in, because he's the Antiochus of the Hanukkah story and the conflict with the Maccabees. 
But the other Greek kingdom that existed at the same time, and in some cases in overlapping territory, was this orange one based in Egypt, known as the Ptolemaic kingdom. And the Ptolemies, again, as a demonstration of that Hellenistic synthetic culture, had themselves declared pharaohs. And they became both kings and gods. And after a couple of generations of inbreeding, because of course, gods can only marry gods, they can't marry mortals, so they wound up marrying their sisters all the time. Uh, it created terrible genetic problems in the household, but they also produced a number of very impressive women, including the more famous Cleopatra, who is from the house of the Ptolemies going down several generations. So there was a big stink recently about an Israeli actress being cast to play Cleopatra, and why didn't they cast a native Egyptian to play it, when the reality was Cleopatra was from a Greek family that had become Hellenized into Egyptian life um, and, and integrated in that Hellenistic version of synthetic culture. Um, now, how this concerns the Judeans is you'll notice the borderline between the um, Seleucid kingdom and the Ptolemaic kingdom is more or less in the land of Israel, the northern part of the land of Israel in this map. But of course, there were battles and wars between the two kingdoms. Initially, after Alexander died and things were divided up, the territory of Judea was under the Ptolemaic Empire, as you would see here in this map. But after a certain period, around the year 200 BCE, after a war between the Ptolemaic and Seleucid Empire, the land of Israel became under the control of the Seleucids. And that's when the troubles began to start with the, with the Maccabees, which we'll talk about um, in just a bit. So that's an overview of the geography of what's happening at the time. Um, but to also think about the cultural process, we have to realize that just because the uh, rabbis had said that prophecy ended with Malachi in around 500 BCE doesn't mean that books in the Bible weren't still being written. In fact, a number of books in the Hebrew Bible we have today reflect this Hellenistic, philosophical, uh, wisdom-based approach. They're actually called, in a, in a genre of, of books called wisdom literature that emphasizes learning, human experience, ancestral wisdom, studying the natural world, all the kind of things that Greeks were doing. Um, remember, the word philosophy is a two-part, a two-rooted word. Philo is love, and Sophia is wisdom. In fact, in many cases, Sophia was personified as almost a goddess or, uh, you know, a, an example of the principle. And you see that reflected in some of these books of wisdom. For example, a book called Proverbs. What are Proverbs? They're wise sayings that you save and give out. So, you know, spare the rod and spoil the child. That's from the book of Proverbs. Um, you know, someone who seeks trouble shall inherit the wind and reap the whirlwind. That's the book of Proverbs. Um, and they even personify wisdom in chapter 8 of Proverbs, which is the passage I have on the screen here. Does not wisdom cry out? Does not understanding raise her voice? On the top of high places, by the way, where the paths meet, she stands. Why would she stand where the paths meet? Because of the exchange of ideas over great distances. Wisdom is a human phenomenon produced by the interaction of cultures. Besides the gates, verse 3, at the entry of the city, at the entry door, she cries aloud, I call to you, men. I send my voice to the sons of humankind. You simple, understand prudence. You fools, be of an understanding heart. Here, for I will speak excellent things. The opening of my lips is for right things, for my mouth speaks truth. Wickedness is an abomination to my lips. There's already a connection between the truth and goodness, and lies or falsehoods or fake news and wickedness. All the words of my mouth are in righteousness. There is nothing, nothing crooked or perverse in them. They are all plain to the, him who understands, right to those who find knowledge. Receive my instruction rather than silver, knowledge rather than choice gold, for wisdom is better than rubies. All the things that may be desired cannot be, compelled, uh, cannot be compared to it. So this wisdom literature appears as well in um, the books of Ecclesiastes with his discussion of how there's a time to every season, a purpose to everything under the heavens. Um, it's better to know than to not know is another uh, famous aphorism included in the book of Ecclesiastes, or even the book of Job, which doesn't really conclude with the God of the Hebrews, who is a God who loves righteousness and punishes wicked and will reward you if you do good. In the end, the God of Job is a God of 
Who do you think you are to challenge me? Do you know how I laid out the stars and how I laid the foundations of the earth? It's study the world and maybe you'll understand the, the divine plan, but it has nothing to do with following direct commandments, <laughs> which Job does explicitly at the beginning. He is a great commandment follower and it doesn't matter. He still suffers. So this wisdom literature is an example of the impact of Greek culture on Jewish life that even found its way into the Hebrew Bible because these books are most likely written in this period of 400, 300, 200 before the Common Era. Okay, so that's a quick overview of the geography and cultural shifts that take place during this, uh, this Hellenistic period. Now, as I alluded to before, there is definitely an opportunity for cultural conflict between the traditional Hebrew culture and this new modern Hellenistic culture. Now, normally Hellenistic culture was tolerant. It, you called it one God, I called it something else, it's not a big deal. But part of the problem came in because the Jews were actually rather impatient. They were insistent on only worshiping one God in one way and not worshiping any other gods. And in many Greek city-states, you actually had a god of the city. And if you were a good citizen, you offered your sacrifice to the god of the city. But if there was no god of the city that you could worship, or you refused to worship the god of the city because you were a Hebrew, well, then you were thought to be a bad citizen or potentially disloyal. They even called Jews atheists, by the way, because not because they were you know, humanists 2,000 years ago, but they called Jews atheists because everyone else had a God that had a statue and the Hebrews had no statue. So they must not believe in the gods. Well, this created some cultural conflict, but what really sets things over the edge is what happens when the Seleucid Empire conquers Judea. Now, Antiochus IV, unusually for Greek city-states, decided to impose Greek culture on everybody and prohibit practices that the Greeks would have hated. As one example, the Greeks hated body modification. They thought the human form was perfect as it was. Certainly the human male form was perfect as it was. And one of the preeminent signs of Judean culture and religion was a significant body modification at eight days old. This is known as circumcision. So the Greeks thought that was terrible. Why would you do that to a baby? And why would you do that to anybody? And where did you come up with this idea of cutting that piece? You know, if you're going to cut something off, why that? So they found that to be abhorrent. And so they thought in their enlightened, everyone else is a barbarian mentality that they would simply ban that backward practice. And let's make them be good citizens by offering sacrifices to all the gods. And let's ban their dietary practice laws because those are separating them from other people in our empire. And if the source of their uh, separatism is this book they keep studying over and over again, then maybe we should ban that one too. It was unusual in the Greco-Roman world for this kind of detailed and banning a religion style persecution. But it seems to be what happened and it seems to be what triggered the Maccabean revolt. But we have to remember, it wasn't only a revolt against Greeks. First of all, it wasn't a revolt against Syrians at all because it was the Seleucid Empire in Syria, but it was Greeks who were running it. Now, the first book of Maccabees begins with the story of Alexander and his, uh, his loss and the division of his uh, kingdom. And then notice what happens here. Antiochus Epiphanes, that's again Antiochus IV, begins to reign, and this is in verse 11 now. In those days, transgressors of the law came out of Israel and persuaded many. So this is not just the Greeks, these are Jews willing to Hellenize themselves. Let us go make a covenant with the Gentiles around us. For since we were separated from them, many evils have befallen us. That proposal was good in their eyes. Some people eagerly went to the king. He authorized them to observe the ordinances of the Gentiles. So what did they do? They built a gymnasium in Jerusalem, according to the laws of the Gentile for naked sports. They made themselves uncircumcised. They forsook the holy covenant, joined themselves to the Gentiles, and sold themselves to do evil. So they're breaking these commandments, these distinguishing, separating commandments, and becoming, if not one with the Gentiles, at least acculturated into Hellenistic culture. The kingdom was established in the site of Antiochus. He planned to reign over Egypt, to reign over many kingdoms. 
He entered with a great mighty chariots and uh, tried to um, uh, and tried to conquer Egypt. And this is again that uh, that back and forth uh, wars that we thought about. And as part of his defeat of Egypt, he returns and went up against Israel with a great multitude. He entered presumptuously into the sanctuary. He took the golden altar, the lampstand for light, all its utensils. He took the table of the showbread, the cup for the drink offerings. He took the gold decoration from the front of the temple. He took away the hidden treasures. He made a great slaughter and spoke arrogantly. There was great mourning upon Israel. Even the beauty of the women changed. The land was moved for its inhabitants. All of Jacob was closed in shame. Now, there was a comment earlier saying that those assimilationist Jews were us. Well, no. <laughs> um, they weren't us because they were assimilating into Greek religion. They weren't questioning the basis of Judean faith. So maybe by behavior, they were looking like us, although at least pre-quarantine, you know, when more people had shaved faces. Um, that, that was, uh, you know, a good example where we had, we had acculturated by, by dress and by, uh, by facial grooming. Uh, but they were interested in Hellenic religion. They weren't necessarily um, interested in pure secularization. We will see early echoes of us uh, at the end of today's class but that's a little bit later in this period. Now, after two full years, the king sent a chief collector of tribute and he came to Jerusalem with a multitude. He fell upon the city suddenly, uh, suddenly destroyed many people of Israel, took spoils of the city, led captive women and children. They fortified the city of David and became their citadel. So he actually set up a fortress there. And now these rebels set up a sinful nation, transgressors of the law and strengthened themselves in it. It became a place to lie in wait against the sanctuary. They shed innocent blood on all sides and defiled the sanctuary itself. The inhabitants of Jerusalem fled become of them. The sanctuary was laid waste. Her feast turned into mornings. And so here is the key part in verse 41. King Antiochus wrote to his whole kingdom that all should be one people and that each should fors forsake his own laws. No distinctiveness, no separatism. Let's all be one people with one religion and one cultural practice. Many of Israel consented to his worship, sacrificed to the idols, and profaned the Sabbath. Again, this is following the Hellenistic religion, not questioning religion entirely. The king sent letters by the hand of messengers of Jerusalem to follow laws strange to the land and forbid. So now this is not just encouraging change, it's forbidding whole burnt offerings and sacrifice and drink offerings in the sanctuary. They should intentionally profane the Sabbath and feast, pollute the sanctuary and those who are holy. They should build altars and temples and shrines for idols and sacrifice swine's flesh and unclean animals. Leave their sons uncircumcised, make their souls abominable with all manner of uncleanness and profanation to forget the law and change all the ordinances, all the halachot, all the laws, all the commandments. Whoever doesn't do according to the word of the king, he shall die. According to all these words, he wrote to his whole kingdom, appointed overseers over all the people. From the people were gathered together to them many, everyone who had forsaken the law. They did evil things in the land. And on the 15th day of Kislev, in the 145th year, this is around uh, in the 160s BCE, they built an abomination of desolation upon the altar. In the cities of Judah, they built altars. They burned incense. They tore the books of the law, which they found in pieces and set them on fire. Again, this is not something that humanistic Jews do. Anyone who was found with a book of the covenant and consented to the law, the king's sentence delivered him to death. Thus they did in their might to Israel. On the 25th day of the month, they sacrificed upon the altar, uh, the idol altar that was on top of the altar of burnt offering. They put to death women who had circumcised their children. They hung their babies around their necks and their houses and those who had circumcised them. Many in Israel were fully resolved and confirmed it not to eat unclean things. They chose to die, that they might not be defiled with the food and not profane the Holy Covenant, and they died. So this was, this was real persecution. And we have confirmation of this from other sources and, and evidence as well, that this really did happen. Um, I'll also point out, by the way, that uh, you might have noticed the 25th day of the month the 25th day of the month is actually when we celebrate Hanukkah now. So who set the date? <laughs> it was actually the date of defilement. And as we'll see, it becomes the date of cleanliness, cleansing, and rededication. So now in chapter two, 
we have the beginning of the rebellion. Mattathias, son of John, son of Shimon, a priest of the sons of Yorib, he rose up, he lived at Modi'in. In verse 6, he saw the blasphemies committed in Judah and Jerusalem and said, woe is me, why was I born to see the destruction? He laments and laments. And so they put on sackcloth and mourn. And now in verse 15, the king's officers enforcing the apostasy came into the city of Modi'in to sacrifice. Many of Israel came to them. The king's officers spoke to Mattathias and said, you are a ruler, an honorable man. You come first and do the commandment of the king as everyone else has done. Mattathias said in a loud voice, even if all the nations listen to him, still I and my sons and our kin will walk in the covenant of our fathers. We will not forsake the law. When he had finished speaking these words, a Jew came in the sight of all to sacrifice on the altar. Mattathias saw it, and so his zeal was kindled, his guts trembled. He vented his wrath and killed the Jew upon the altar. He killed that man. He then also killed the king's officers who compelled the men to sacrifice. He pulled down the altar. He was zealous for the law, just like Pinchas had done to Zimri. This was a case in the Exodus story where a priest kills a man and his Midianite whore at once because they're having sex in the temple of, in the, the tent of meeting where Yahweh's presence dwells. And so he's praised. Pinchas is there, and Mattathias is here for his zeal. But notice the first casualty of the Maccabean rebellion is a Jew who's willing to Hellenize. It's not only the outside power. And so Mattathias cried out in the city and called out for all to follow him. Um, initially, some of those who follow him are so pious, they won't fight on the Sabbath. And so they were killed. <laughs> they all died. And so Mattathias heard about that and said, hmm, Maybe we should be a little more flexible on the Sabbath day. If they attack us, we'll fight, but we won't start attacking on the Sabbath day. So now the Hasidians, the pious men, are gathered together. They mustered an army. They struck the sinners in their anger. So they're fighting the Jews too. And many of those assimilated Jews are flying to the, G the Gentiles for safety. They forcibly circumcised the boys who were uncircumcised. They tore down the altars. They pursued the arrogant. They rescued the law out of the hands of the Gentiles and the hands of the kings. And so finally, after many travails, and the uh, Book of Maccabees describes many uh, battles and wars that they fought, finally, they managed to conquer Jerusalem and tear down uh, that old altar. In, starting in verse 36 here. Judas and his kindred said, Behold, our enemies are defeated. Let's go up to cleanse the holy place and rededicate it. They were gathered together. They went up to Mount Zion. They saw the sanctuary laid desolate, the altar profaned, the gates burned up, the shrubs growing in the court as on a forest, the priest's chambers torn down, and they tore their clothes, made lamentation, put ashes upon their head, fell on their faces to the ground, blew the solemn trumpets high to heaven. Now Judas appointed blameless priests who were devoted to the law, not the corrupt priests who had been working in the temple all along. Those were gotten rid of. They cleansed the holy place and carried the defiled stones out to an unclean place. They deliberated what to do with the altar of burnt offerings, which had been profaned. This is an interesting question. What do you do with a holy altar that had been holy and now has had pig's flesh on it? Do you destroy it, but those were holy stones? Do you leave it, but it's been profaned? So a good plan came into their mind. They pull it down, lest it be a reproach to them, and they laid the stones of the temple hill in a convenient place until a prophet would come to give an answer concerning them. Well, wait for the, the, the God to tell us what to do with these defiled holy stones. And they took whole new stones according to the law that had never been carved with a metal instrument and built a new altar, the holy place. They consecrated the courts. They made new holy vessels, brought the lampstand and the temple into the, the table into the temple. They burned incense on the altar and lit the lamps upon the lampstand and gave light in the temple, put loaves on the table, hung up curtains and finished all the work they had done. They rose up early in the morning on the 25th day of the ninth month and offered a sacrifice according to the law on the new altar of burnt offerings they had made. At the, de at the time and the day the Gentiles had profaned it, even then it was dedicated with harps, lutes, songs, and cymbals. The people fell on their faces and worshipped and gave praise to heaven. They celebrated the dedication of the altar for eight days and offered burnt offerings with gladness, sacrifice of deliverance, and praise. They decorated the front of the temple with crowns of gold and small shields. There was great gladness. Uh, because the reproach of the Gentiles was turned away. Judah and his kindred and the whole congregation of Israel ordained the days of dedication of the altar. Dedication, by the way, in Hebrew is Hanukkah. 
should be kept in their season from year to year for eight days from the 25th day of the month of Kislev with gladness and joy. And so we have here an origin story for the event of Hanukkah. But, and I'll bring us back for a discussion for just a moment, um, what's weird about that version of the story? What was missing? The oil. The miracle. <laughs> the miracle oil. It's a miracle. There's no miracle. <laughs> well, it disappeared. What happened there? There's no mention of a miracle. Also, I'll, I'll point out, they, the first dedication festival was eight days already. Right? They decreed it as an eight-day dedication festival, and then they decided to make it an annual event the next year and the next year. But you'd think the first year they planned one day, and whoa, it kept going. And then they had, But there's no mention of a, uh, a miracle at all in that story. And also, again, I'll point out that the Jews didn't set the date. It was the, it was the Greeks who set the date for the 25th of Kislev, and the Jews simply are trying to replace that date, like a counter-programming e exercise. Um, in fact, I had one teacher in uh, graduate school who suggested that one of the major festivals under the Seleucid Empire was the celebration of the king's birthday. And so this could have been Antiochus's birthday and we're still lighting candles, even if he's not around to blow them out anymore. So this is you know, just one example of how when you read the original versions of the stories, it may be different. Now, the books of Maccabees were actually commissioned by the Maccabean kings themselves. So we know they're not objective history, right? The court historian is not gonna tell you know, uh, all the, the dark sides of the story. Uh, but they are very close to the events that took place. The story about the miracle of the lights doesn't appear until the Talmud, like four or 500 years CE. So we're talking five to 600 years after the events of Hanukkah. It doesn't appear in the books of Maccabees. It doesn't appear in the historian Josephus's writings, which he's writing about the, the end of the first century uh, BCE. So maybe 150 years after these events. Um, it doesn't appear in the Mishnah, the early collection of rabbinic writings. They refer to Hanukkah as a date people know, and they, uh, but they don't talk about a reason for Hanukkah or how to do Hanukkah. There's no separate discussion of Hanukkah as a holiday. It's just mentioned as a time of year. It's not really clarified what you do. It isn't until the Talmud that you get a story of why you light the lights and how you light the lights and when you light the lights and what the background narrative is to the, to the holiday. And it attributes attributes it to the miracle of the light because it undermines the power of the Maccabees. Now, why eight days for that first festival? Well, for that, you have to dive back into the books of Kings because you may remember David, the king, does not create the first um, temple. Uh, it is his son Solomon who, in fact, establishes the first temple. And Solomon, when he builds the temple, has a dedication festival for it, and it's decreed as a festival of eight days. It's actually a seven-day festival, and on the eighth day, they wrap it up. Um, it's like the Encore Day. So this dedication of the temple could be seen as a reenactment of the Solomon dedication of the first temple, and that's why they made it for eight days, not because the oil lasted for eight days. However, there's not only one book of Maccabees that are included in the Catholic and the Greek Orthodox canons. They're not in the Hebrew Bible, by the way. They were not saved by the rabbis when they picked which books to include, as we'll talk about next time, uh, sorry, in January. Um, but they, uh, they were preserved by the Catholic Church uh, and by the Greek Orthodox Church. And in the second book of Maccabees, we get a different rationale for why Hanukkah is eight days long. So in second Maccabees, we get much more detailed description of the martyrdom and the persecution. For example, chapter seven has the discussion of seven brothers and their mother who were all commanded to eat pig and they all die rather than submitting to it. And it's a demonstration of their zeal, their, their pious faith that they're willing to do this. Um, in fact, there's one speculation that um, the persecution under the uh, Antiochus empire was a trigger to Jews beginning to believe in an afterlife because before then, the Torah was very explicit. It said, if you follow these laws, you will be successful and happy and live a long life. And when you're persecuted for your religion, it's the exact opposite. The ones who follow the law are suffering and dying, and the ones who break the law are living it up. So 
something had to give here and perhaps the idea of an afterlife appears as a way to uh, answer that question. In fact, the only book of the Hebrew Bible that reflects some belief in some kind of an afterlife is the book of Daniel, which is thought to have been written around the time of the Maccabean persecution. Uh, one of the last written books to make it into the Hebrew Bible, uh, written in that second century BCE. So um, again, an interesting trigger to uh, theological development through historical experience. But in chapter 10, they give their own reason for why celebrate for eight days. Here you have, again, they recover the temple, they pulled down the altars, they made another altar of sacrifice, they relit the lamps, they, they uh, put out the showbread again, they uh, asked for no more sins and um, not to be delivered to barbarous heathen. And again, in verse five, on the same day, the sanctuary was profaned by foreigners. On that very day, the sanctuary was cleansed, the 25th of Kislev. They observed eight days with gladness. Why? In the manner of the Feast of Tabernacles, Sukkot. Remembering how not long before, during tabernacles, they were wandering in the mountains and in caves. Therefore, carrying the lulav, carrying wands wreathed with leaves and beautiful branches and palm fronds, they offered up hymns of thanksgiving to him who had successfully brought to pass the cleansing of his own place. They ordained with public statute and decree they should observe these days every year. So here we have another rationale for why eight days, because it's a reenactment of Sukkot out of season. Now, which is the real reason? Again, you, you pick your book of Maccabees, you decide which way it is. Um, there could have been even a pre-existing lights holiday at the end of the year that they preempted or co-opted. And it might have been seven or eight days even before there were Maccabees who then set their event uh, at that time of year to make it that much more uh, resonant and meaningful. Um, so the Maccabees ultimately uh, gained their freedom. They managed to defeat all of the Greek armies sent against them. Um, but they begin to make mistakes because, you know, that old line, power corrupts, well, it happens to the Maccabees too. First off, we saw in the first book of Maccabees that they were a priestly family, but they weren't a high priestly family. Remember the line of Zadok and the, the claim of the clans of the high priest? The Maccabees were priests, they were Cohens, but they weren't Cohensetic. They weren't the high priest line. And yet once they conquered the city and rededicated the temple, they made themselves into high priests. And so some people began to be upset with them then. Then they made a bigger mistake because they saw what the Ptolemies got to do because they were religious officials and kings at the same time. Why couldn't they do the same thing? And so then the Maccabees began to style themselves not only as high priests, but also as kings. Now that's a big no-no because remember, the only rightful king that's allowed under Judean religion is from the line of King David, which is a totally different tribe. David was from the, uh, the tribe of, uh, of Judah not the tribe of Levi, which is where the Cohens come from. So there's no way you could be a priest and high king uh, and a king at the same point. Yet the Maccabees were claiming to be both high priests and kings. And that upset a great number of people. And ultimately what undid the Maccabees was the temptations of Hellenization because that culture was seductive. And you can see it even in the names they gave their sons because you begin with great Jewish Judean names like Matatiahu, Mattathias, Yehuda, Judah, Shimon, Simeon. After a couple generations, you get Hyrcanos and Aristobulus and even Alexander, you know, a big sign of Hellenization there when you name your Maccabean kid, Alexander. And so between their Hellenization, their affluence, their establishment of themselves as kings and high priests, Ultimately, the Maccabees engendered the same kind of pietist rebellion against them that they had fomented against the Greeks. In this case, it was resolved more peaceably um, because a particular sect that was opposed to the Maccabees and their elitism won out and was able to convince the, the priests to follow their practice. And so we'll talk about that in just a minute. Now, in terms of geography in this period, and I want to make sure we leave time for our discussion questions too, um, there are three major centers for Judean life. There's Babylonia, which we talked about of people who stayed there after the Babylonian exile. There was a new center that developed under the Ptolemaic period. Remember Ptolemy and his empire based in Egypt was in charge of Judea for the first hundred years or so. This was a new city called Alexandria. And by its peak of population, Alexandria was one third Greek, one third native Egyptian and one third Judean, one third Jewish. It was a very attractive place to be because if you had the choice of living in you know, Bumpkinsville Hill Country, Judea, or New York City, Alexandria, 
Well, a lot of people chose to live in New York City, Alexandria. And that's where they began to teach their kids Greek, to learn Greek culture, to dress differently, to cut their hair in the Greek style, and so on. So much so that by around the year 200 BCE, they didn't even understand the Hebrew Bible they were hearing in their meeting houses anymore. By the way, the word for house of meeting in Hebrew is Beit Knesset, what we today call synagogue, synagogue, right? Synagogue, synod is like a meeting, um, and Gog is a place. So the, um, the synagogue was the house of meeting that they had developed to share the stories of the Torah that they were learning, but they didn't understand the Hebrew anymore. And so they began to translate this into Greek. Ultimately, it becomes a collection called the Septuagint, which is the basis for the Christian Old Testament. The books were in a slightly different order after the Torah. Um, and they were all, of course, put into Greek from the original Hebrew. Uh, but it includes all the books you'll find in our modern Tanakh, modern Hebrew Bible, plus some other books like the Maccabees books, like the book of Judith and some other uh, examples. Um, you also have an openness to try to synthesize Jewish thought and philosophy. In fact, there's a Jewish philosopher who writes in Greek, whose name is Philo, again, from that word of philosophy, who tries to harmonize the revelations of the Torah with the ideas of Greek philosophy. And he presents um, Moses as a lawgiver, which is a, a wonderful trope in Greek literature. You know, you have Solon, the lawgiver of Athens and other examples. So Moses is cast in the role of the Greco-Roman hero of the philosophical lawgiver. And so he's not re re getting magic revelations a la, you know, literal reading of the Torah. But if you read it allegorically, as Philo tries to interpret it, he is a lawgiver who has deep insight into the nature of the universe, a la wisdom literature, a la philosophy. But this doesn't always go well. You know, that accusation of bad citizenship, of not being a good Alexandrian by not worshiping the city gods, becomes a problem. The native Egyptians are not thrilled to have the Judeans be there and be economically successful, and that becomes a problem. Ultimately, there are riots, even what we would call today pogroms, that take place in Alexandria and undermine the basis of Jewish life in the city by about the second century of the common era. So it's, it's good there for about 300 years, but it begins to go downhill over time. And then there's Judea itself, which for a period of time under the Maccabees from about 160 BCE until about 60 BCE when the Romans appear does have an independent Judean kingdom. And that's one of the reasons, by the way, that the Zionist movement in the 19th and 20th century hearkened back to the Maccabees as role models for them because they were willing to fight for independence and they achieved the last independent Judean kingdom for any appreciable period of time. And uh, as one example of this, when they wanted to create a kind of um, Jewish athletic events, a kind of Jewish Olympics, they called it the Maccabee Games, the Maccabee Games. You may have heard of that before. Of course, the irony in the Maccabee Games is the Maccabees themselves would have hated a Jewish Olympics, right? <laughs> that was one of the things that set them off. But, you know, uh, history has its uh, wonderful ironies, for sure. So the last thing I wanted to touch on was, with the discomfort over the Maccabees, uh, their establishment of themselves as kings and high priests, there were a number of people who began to decide, you know, that rulership, that leadership is really problematic for us. And they developed into what uh, the historian Josephus referred to as different sects different sort of schools of philosophical thought or religious practice or trends in Judean life that all sacrificed at the temple or pointed the temple as the center of their attention, but they, um, they also went their own separate ways in terms of ritual practice and even belief and scripture. So the three major sects that are described by Josephus are the Sadducees, the uh, Essenes, and the Pharisees. The Sadducees claim descendants from Zadok, the priests, they were the establishment, the elites, the Maccabeans, the priests, right? They're the ones who said, whatever is in the Torah is what we follow. We don't interpret too much. And uh, so if it says in the Torah, do not kindle a light during the Sabbath, we will do Shabbat in the dark. We don't have any lights lit. And we, follow, we believe that the, this life is the only one there is because that's what the Torah says. And, um, and uh, judgment is here and now in this world. Those were the Sadducees. And they were, again, the priests, the elite, they focused on the rituals of the temple. The Essenes were more of an ascetic sect. They wanted to withdraw from society. They believed that society was corrupted. The priests in charge were the wrong priests. They were even evil priests who had usurped the rightful place of the true priests. In fact, 
the Essenes probably evolved out of Sadducean philosophy because they had started out as priests or followers of priests, but they were usurped in this priestly rivalry. In fact, they were led initially, when we read their library found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, or Qumran is the name of the community you can find there, even today, um, they refer to uh, someone they call the teacher of righteousness, who was the founder of the community. And they had, uh, even though they were in the middle of the desert, they had a mikvah for ritual baths, and they were writing holy scrolls and interpreting dreams and doing all kinds of ascetic practices. In fact, even imagining that there would be an upcoming cataclysm, a war between the sons of light and the sons of darkness. It would be a judgment day, an apocalypse. Apocalyptic literature is not only a Christian phenomenon. In fact, it existed among the Essenes even before uh, the New Testament. And John the Baptist, as one example, may well have been an Essene because of his living in the desert and doing um, baptisms, uh, a.k.a. mikvah, and proclaiming a coming end of days. If today you go to the Hebrew uh, Museum in Jerusalem, they have a special museum for the Dead Sea Scrolls called the Shrine of the Book, and the coloration on the outside is a white lid on the jar and a black uh, cylinder that runs around the museum. And that's by design. It's the war of the sons of light and darkness reflecting Essene theology. And the third group decided by just, uh, described by Josephus are called the Pharisees. They are willing to interpret the Torah. They have what they call traditions of the ancestors that allow them to leave lights lit on Shabbat if they're lit before Shabbat begins, to have new versions of approaching um, the sacrifices, new liturgies they can create. Um, they're more willing to interpret and be flexible, and they believe in some kind of life after death. The Pharisees are basically the ancestors of the rabbis. And so we'll talk more about them next uh, in uh, January when we turn to the change to rabbinic Judaism. Now, there is one group that Josephus doesn't talk about, but we would love to talk about, and these are these Hellenistic Jews, the descendants of those Hellenizers who stayed Judean, didn't vanish, but still were interested in Greek language and culture and philosophy, like Philo, um, like the Jews of Alexandria, but they were not always looked on uh, provingly by the Jews of Judea because they were the traditionalists following the school of the Maccabees. And they came up with an epithet for those Hellenizing Jews, and the epithet they would use was Apichorus. Now, why Apichorus? Because there's a Greek philosopher named Epicurus. And if you have a chance to read any Epicurus, you might find him surprisingly refreshing because he reflects a very, what we would call humanistic mindset. Now he does claim to believe in the gods, but he believes the gods have no interest whatsoever in what human beings do. Because if you're truly a perfect God, why would you care what people do or say or sacrifice to you? Why would your happiness be dependent on people obeying you? You wouldn't care what the people would do. And so Epicurus says, don't worry about the gods. They don't care about you either. And he says, don't worry about, you know, uh, a life after death. We're made up of little particles called atoms. And when we die, they disperse and get spread all over the world. And I don't know what happened before I existed. And I won't know what happened after I existed. I'll be gone. And we don't have to worry about it. So the point of Epicurean philosophy was enjoy this life. You know, uh, in fact, he suggested don't, don't become a glutton who becomes dependent on foie gras and fancy food because you're bound to be disappointed. What you really need to do is train yourself to be happy with bread and water, and then you'll always be happy. So if the goal is a fruitful and enjoyable life in this life, simple pleasures of friendship, of simple food, of beautiful days, that's enough. That's all we need. Now, evidently enough Jews were attracted or at least vaguely familiar with Epicurean philosophy that his name becomes the quintessential heretical definition of the Jew who knows what he should do, but doesn't. And he is the heretic, the Apichorus. And this is even in use today. Um, when I first came to Kol Hadaj, I had a suggestion that we rename our High Holiday Choir into the Apichorus. Uh, but it turns out that um, uh, the uh, Reconstructionist Rabbinical Seminary already has a mixed gender choir that they call the Apichorus going back uh, a couple generations. So. I was, uh, my, my joke was already taken. Okay, so that's it for our uh, overview uh, of this Hellenistic period and the major trends therein. Um, any comments, questions in general at this point before we go on to our uh, discussion questions? Actually, I do have one quick question. Sure. So um, you were, the, the, were the different tribes of Israel 
um, do they marry inside or outside the tribe? I mean, were they exogamous? I mean, because I, if, because you could have had a mother who was from the tribe of David if you were a Levite. So I was just wondering. Uh, you mean in the earlier period? Um, well, in theory, because remember, yeah, most of those tribes have vanished by now. Well, yeah, but I mean, in theory, but I mean, for for example, the Ma the Maccabees, if yeah. if. You're saying like, well, they were from the tribe, the, the Levi's, right? So because they're Cohen. Well, the, the way it worked, um, certainly under, the way it works now under rabbinic Judaism is your tribe follows your father, whether you're okay. or not follows your mother. So if a, uh, a Levite man marries a non-Levite woman, the kids are going to be Levites. Okay. So it's patrilineal in that sense. The tribe identity is patrilineal. Exactly. Right. Um, but if, but are they exogamous at the same time, or, or is, you know, do you have to marry outside, or does no, it... you can marry outside of your um, your tribe? I mean, there are a few limitations on the Cohens, on the priests. So, for example, yeah. a Cohen is not allowed to marry a convert, oh, okay. because the assumption is they were, you know, sexually improper before, anyway. So you can't trust them. Um, I mean, it's it's disgusting, but that's that's part of the, the theology. Um, uh, so they have, they can't marry a divorced women. They can't marry a convert. Um, but a Cohen could marry an Israelite of another tribe uh, that was uh, a, a, um, a woman. Again, women are women. Women can have Cohen status via husband. Um, but uh, I think in some cases, um, a Cohen marrying outside the Cohen clan, um, their their kids are not quite as high status as uh, as before. There's all okay. kinds of subtleties to this kind of pedigree stuff. Okay, just kind of curious. Yeah, sure. Yes, Susie? Yeah, so the Hellenized Jews became Epicurus. Um, well, it's what the rabbinic Jews yeah, called them. <laughs> right, from Epicurus. Over time, over longevity, what happened? Did they stay affiliated or did they disperse? You gotta, you gotta into the next classes. <laughs> you wanna what? look ahead. You got to wait for the next couple classes. This oh, you're gonna get to it. Okay, yeah. you, you posed a question. <laughs> I didn't know when you're gonna get to it. Yeah, 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 because they're still around in the Roman period and they begin okay. to fade away in the rabbinic period for a couple of reasons. I'm patient, I'm patient, okay. but I'm curious. And I didn't know I had to wait and that's all. I'm good. Okay. I'm good. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so I'm just introducing them here. They haven't vanished yet. But I mean, look, the, the problem with Hellenistic Judaism, and this is why I pushed back a bit on Rin's claim, it's us, it's us, is that, I mean, first of all, you can't project your values back, you know, 2000 years, that's too simplistic. Um, but also, um, they're, they're sort of a historical dead end. They disappear at a certain point in time. And I don't want that as a model for us. You know, I'm optimistic that we'll have some longevity here. Um, and also, they wind up getting co-opted because someone else comes up with an idea based more or less on Jewish theology. But now you don't have to worry about the dietary laws and the circumcision and all that stuff. That was the problem. And that was the, that was the source of conflict between Greek culture and uh, Judean culture. Um, you know, and once you can do it without that, and you're saved by faith and not by works via Christianity, yeah. a lot of those Hellenized Jews uh, wound up being pulled into Christianity. In fact, when you read the New Testament, um, Paul is going around traveling, preaching. Guess where he's going? He's going to synagogues. <laughs> he's preaching in Greek. <laughs> um, so, you know, he's reaching out to these Hellenized Jews that have their meeting houses all through the Jewish diaspora. Um, and, uh, you know, so that, that's one of the, the end results of these Hellenized Jews. I mean, there were revolts against uh, the Romans um, that, uh, that were a disaster, and that wiped out certain Hellenized communities. There was Christian uh, conversion. And ultimately, rabbinic Judaism supersedes them. It sort of swallows them up. Um, there is still a community called the Romaniot who claim descent from these early Hellenized Jews. But they also got sort of subordinated under rabbinic Judaism's umbrella, even if they kept some distinct practices, continued to use Greek as a ritual language and so on. Uh, but, uh, but most Hellenized Jews do eventually vanish. And this is the balancing act that we're still grappling with. How do we find the right balance between particularism, distinctiveness, separation on one hand, and integration and openness to the surrounding culture on the other? Um, I'm just uh, now on the uh, Humanistic Judaism Facebook discussion group that the society runs, um, there's an ongoing debate over, um, one person said, I'm really annoyed by Christmas stuff. And other people said, I love Christmas stuff. 
And someone else said, my husband's Christian and we do Christmas stuff. And what are you saying about what we're doing in our home? And, it, and it's just this, this battle back and forth. And it's one more example of the how, how distinct do we need to be? And different people are going to have different answers to that. It's not quite the level of Maccabee and, you know, killing each other. But uh, this, that's where it started, <laughs> you know, um, arguing over what you were and weren't allowed to do and still be Jewish. Um, that, uh, you know, that, that's an argument or a debate we're still having.